The next item of business is Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body Question Time. I'll try to get everyone in as, that wishes to speak, uh, so fairly short and succinct questions, if you could. And the first question, question number one, is Fulton McGregor. So I'll ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body whether it will consider installing automated external defibrillators in or on the external walls of MSP constituency offices. Jackson Carlow. Uh, the Scottish Parliament corporate body considered this matter on the 14th of June when Mr McGregor first raised it with us. Now we advised him then that whilst the corporate body is supportive of having public access to fibrillators available across Scotland, the first principle of the reimbursement of members expenses scheme is to meet expenses incurred by members in carrying out their parliamentary duties and therefore this could not be funded through the scheme. And similarly there is no provision in the Scotland Act for the corporate body to meet such costs directly. Fulton McGregor. Yeah, I thank Jackson and Carlo for that response and um, I appreciate the letter that was sent to me um, on the, the dates mentioned. I'd like to take this um, opportunity just to place some of the work in my um, a local area from the Adrian Copebridge uh, first responders to the Beth Football Club to Mount Ellen Golf Club who have done a lot of work in this area. By installing these devices, not only would we be making them available for parliamentary staff working in constituency offices, but where possible they can be installed on the external walls of MSP offices, which would make them available 24 hours a day. And I'd ask Jackson Carlo if the um, parliamentary corporate body would reconsider this decision at any point in the future. Jackson Carlo. The value of public access defibrillators and I participated in schemes in my own constituency with voluntary organisations and community councils who've worked to raise the funding to have them installed on buildings like public libraries. Uh, one of the points the British Heart Foundation makes is that where a defibrillator is installed, it really must be a permanently available resource because people might come to anticipate that it's there and rely upon it. And how can I put this? It's not, it's not necessarily the case that MSPs parliamentary offices will be a permanently available resource in that elections can lead to a change in representation and MSPs themselves can be inclined to change offices. So for a number of reasons I'm not sure that it, the MSPs office is actually the most suitable place for a defibrillator to be housed but in any event um, the actual access opportunities for the corporate body to look at to fund it don't permit it. Uh, if I can have very quick uh, supplementaries, please, and answers. I'll get them all in. Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much. The key issue, of course, around defibrillators and um, these matters is that people know how to use them when they're required. And you will be aware of the campaigning activity by St Andrew's First Aid and others to ensure that we all have the life-saving skills um, to, when the chance might or the opportunity or the occasion might arise. Can I ask the corporate body to explore the, explore the possibility of rolling out a programme of first aid training of amongst MSP staff and parliamentary staff, a skill which literally saves life and would give a very strong message about the corporate body and the Scottish Parliament as a responsible employer. Jackson Carlow. Yes, I'm, I'm happy to take that back to the corporate body, although I should say I did recently participate as a member in exactly that training, uh, which I think was available to all members and staff to participate in, uh, which was all about how to uh, administer CPR. Obviously, uh, defibrillators are an additional uh, resource, but I mean, from my understanding of the defibrillators I've seen in action, uh, there obviously is an assist button and there's a, con a direct connection to a helpline who will advise people who are in a situation where they are unfamiliar with the use of one, how they do use it. But I think, yes, anybody who has been trained in it is therefore able to act much more rapidly and we know that lives have been saved as a result. So the most wide possible access to defibrillators is, I think, something we all support and will encourage. But I'll take the member's point back to the corporate body to see if there's more that we can do in terms of training here in the Parliament. Uh, quick supplementaries, please, from Jamie Green, then Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I, I appreciate the situation regarding the funding uh, would not be made available for MSPs to put them outside their offices, but if MSPs were able to source these through other means, through charitable measures, for example, uh, would the corporate body in principle uh, be uh, uh, supportive of uh, having them outside our offices, especially as there's a lot of restrictions around signage and, and what these offices can be used for. Thank you. Jackson Carlow. Yes, I, I think we would have no objection to it, but bearing in mind, however, the advice from the British Heart Foundation that we need to be sure that 
we don't build up a public expectation of a resource being available only to find that within a relatively short space it's not. But I think, yes, working with community councils and other voluntary groups is the right way to proceed. Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, President Officer, um, Kathleen Orr from the Jaden's Rainbow uh, campaign presented her petition to the uh, Petitions Committee this morning in the Scottish Parliament and afterwards uh, when we had a discussion uh, about, uh, about that session. She raised the point regarding the Scottish Parliament and the lack of signage in the Parliament uh, regarding uh, defibrillators. Uh, so can the corporate body uh, please inform me of how many defibs there actually are in the Scottish Parliament and will they improve the signage for them, please? Jackson Carlo. That point is noted and I, we will take it back to the corporate body. I thank Mr McMillan. Okay, before we move on to question two, I know that that was a very important issue, but there seems to be a misunderstanding about what quick supplementary means. So can we bear that in mind going forward? Question number two, Daniel Johnson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body for what reason the Freedom of Information Disclosure Log has not been updated. Andy White. Uh, the Scottish Parliament put in place our Freedom of Information Disclosure Log in 2005 shortly after the Freedom of Information legislation came into effect. And as part of our normal practice, we inform requesters that information released to them may be posted on the Parliament's disclosure log within 24 hours. Unfortunately, as I think the member uh, is aware, the disclosure log has not been updated recently because the staff responsible for that have had to focus on work required to fulfill our statutory freedom of information and data protection obligations. And in addition, the team have been providing ongoing advice and guidance on data protection requirements following on from the implementation of the General Data Protection Regulation and the Data Protection Act 2018. The corporate body, however, do recognize the importance of freedom of information and has taken steps to ensure um, that the disclosure log will return to its regular updating cycle early in the new year when a vacant post within the team responsible uh, for updating the log will be filled. Daniel Johnson. Um, I'd thank Andy Whiteman for that answer. However, I do believe that this parliament should lead by example. And I think it's now about around three months since the, the disclosure log was last updated. Um, so I'd wonder if uh, he would agree with me that we should in endeavour to update it at the earliest opportunity. Um, and moreover, I was wondering if you could clarify the number of outstanding requests which would have otherwise been disclosed, which currently have not been. Andy Whiteman. Um, as I said in my initial answer, the um, disclosure log will be back up and running to its uh, regular cycle in, in, in January. Um, the member notes that we should be leading by example, and I think we were, if not the first public authority, certainly amongst the first public authorities, to voluntarily publish a disclosure log. As the member knows, that is not a statutory requirement, uh, but it is good practice, and we have had one since 2005. Uh, I can't give uh, the member a direct answer to how many uh, disclosures, freedom of information requests, are not up in the log because of the delay that's built uh, up. Um, but we have replied to 140 freedom of information requests uh, in 2018. Um, we only have two freedom of information requests that are currently under review, uh, and we have no appeals uh, to the information, uh, Scottish Information Commissioner uh, so far in 2018. Question number three, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body what employment schemes it runs for offenders in order to improve their skills, reduce re-offending and increase its recruitment of ex-offenders. Kezia Dugdale. The Scottish Parliament corporate body actively promotes the quality of opportunity for all with the right mix of talent, skills and potential and welcomes applications from all sections of society. The SPCB policy on the employment of ex-offenders commits us to ensuring that no job applicant or member of staff will receive less favourable treatment than others because of her or his offending background or any other characteristic not relevant to the role. We don't have any immediate plans to prioritise the creation of a programme exclusively for the recruitment of people with offending backgrounds, but we continue to review the extent to which our recruitment arrangements deliver fairness and ensure that no groups are excluded. Mark Griffin. Thank you, Isidore Dugdale, for that answer. My question today was lodged following a discussion with a Modern Studies class at Greenfields High School in Cumminald, who are currently looking into to justice issues. So really, it's their question. And um, One of the things they're looking into is restorative justice and the schemes like Release Scotland and those run by Timpsons, which now has 10% of its staff recruited directly from prison through a selection, training and mentoring programme. 
Their chief executive chairs the Employers Forum for Reducing Reoffending, which is a group that offers a second chance to people with a criminal conviction and encourages other employers to be more willing to recruit ex-offenders. Can I ask Kezia Dugdale what plans the corporate body has to apply to join the likes of Greggs, the Scottish Government and Timpsons by becoming a member of Release Scotland and if it will write to Greenfalls High School Modern Studies class setting out how it will come to any decision. Can I thank the member for that follow-up. We are aware of Release Scotland uh, and their work that they do uh, across the private sector, and he's right to acknowledge the work that Greggs and Timpsons do, but also in the public and third sector, uh, promoting the employment of people with offending backgrounds. And I'm sure that he's aware that one third of men and nine percent of women have uh, a conviction in their past. Yet 75 percent of employers say that they wouldn't employ someone with an offending uh, history. I would say to the member though that the corporate body are pretty confident that we don't discriminate uh, against offenders. For example, we don't require people to disclose their uh, offending background in job application forms and we don't hold any of that information in employment records. Um, so I think we'd be particularly keen to know what membership of release would add to our current systems before committing uh, to join it. Uh, I think that's an unusual request to, to write to that particular school, but I'll personally endeavour to respond to the pupils at Greenfield, uh, Greenfold High School to ensure that they have a, an appropriate answer. I'll either do that in a, a formal capacity from the corporate body or in a personal capacity, whatever seemed most appropriate by the corporate body. Question number four, Ross Greer. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Parliament corporate body what measures it has taken to protect the Parliament from cyber attacks. Kezia Dugdale. The Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body fully recognises the importance of cyber resilience for all organisations has never been greater. Digital technologies are vital to the successful operation of all modern organisations and the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body has put in place a variety of tools, technologies and procedures to protect the Parliament from a successful attack. Our critical cyber security controls have recently undergone an independent assessment of their effectiveness, leading to an award of Cyber Essentials Plus certification for the Parliament. In addition to the technical measures and controls put in place, an ongoing campaign to raise awareness of cyber security issues will help ensure that all network users are mindful of how they can contribute to defending our Parliament from cyber attacks. Ross Greer. Thank Kezia Dugdale for that answer. The corporate body will be aware of the upcoming visit of the Russian ambassador to the Scottish Parliament. Given that Russia is a hostile state that has not only killed uh, citizens on UK soil, but is engaged in extensive cyber attacks against political parties, governments and other institutions across the world, could the corporate body provide further detail on what specific measures and assessments have taken place in advance of the visit of the ambassador? Kezia Dugdale. If I could say to the member that just this morning the Scottish Parliament corporate body received a briefing from the National Cyber Security Centre and we will use the information we receive on threats and vulnerabilities to ensure that our cyber defences evolve to best manage the uh, risks that we face from wherever they come from and I would emphasise that point from wherever they come from that's not uh, an action we've taken this morning in response to any specific attack from Russia but it's to make sure that procedures we have in place are as up to date and as well resourced as they possibly can be and I hope that offers the member the reassurance he's looking for. Question number five, David Stewart. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body what discussions it's had with Police Scotland regarding the provision of home security assessment reports for members. Jackson Carlo. Uh, members' personal safety is an issue that the corporate body takes very seriously. To ensure that support to members reflects the security risks members face, the corporate body works closely with Police Scotland and other security partners to make that assessment. The security of members at their homes and at their Edinburgh accommodation has been discussed by the corporate body, but on assessment <clears throat> has focused on local offices and surgeries for making uh, security enhancements. The corporate body has approved a budget that members can access to upgrade the security at the local offices based on recommendations taken from surveys undertaken by local crime prevention officers. The corporate body has also purchased loan worker devices which are available to members and their staff as an additional security measure. Police Scotland and the Security Office also provide personal safety briefings to members and their staff on request. Now, members can contact Police Scotland for an assessment of their home security. Police Scotland will undertake a survey similar to that provided at local offices and will make recommendations to the member for simple measures that could be put in place to improve their home security. The corporate body does not at the moment provide a fund for members to access for implementation of any security measures that are recommended. At, as home security, as it's not currently assessed as being the main area of risk. 
David Stewart. Uh, thank you, Mr. I am very grateful to Mr. Carlo for his reply. Could I first of all place on record my thanks to the corporate body for the provision of security for members' offices and could I encourage my colleagues who have not activated this to do this as soon as possible. Uh, Mr. Carlo will be aware that the House of Commons Joint Committee on Security has commissioned an independent review of MPs' personal home security. Uh, notwithstanding Mr. Carlo's reply, will the corporate body consider, at the very least, a request to Police Scotland to undertake a review of security of MSPs' homes as a precursor to a wider strategy on member and staff security? Jackson Carlo. I, I would concur with uh, Mr Stewart's view that every member should take advantage of the opportunity to have their own uh, constituency premises surveyed for, by Police Scotland for any recommendations or risks that might be addressed. And yet we are obviously aware that has been the subject of our discussion of the fact that both the Welsh Assembly and Westminster have introduced home security arrangements for members. We've obviously focused where we feel that the main areas of risk are and we've taken the advice throughout from Police Scotland on that. As I say, it doesn't preclude members from contacting Police Scotland or the security office to arrange a review um, of their home security if this would provide the member with additional reassurance. I only say that at this time, the SPCB would expect the member to meet the costs of upgrading their home security themselves, although where there are particular concerns for the member's personal safety, the SPCB would naturally consider any applications for funding of home security in those particular circumstances. That concludes SPCB question time and we will move on to the next item of business once everyone has the chance to shift their seats.